Genshin ships. Kind of a hot topic. Some people love the shipping aspect of Genshin, some people hate it, but regardless of how you feel about it, you can't deny that it is a big part of the Genshin community. Throughout all my different Genshin videos, I've had a handful of comments along the lines of, Coley, I trust you, Genshin ships. Explain. A lot of Genshin ships, I realize, elude people, either because they aren't super familiar with shipping, or they just don't see the appeal, or the why behind it. So I figured, for those who are curious, here's your guide. I will be going through 50 or so different ships. Some of them are really popular, some of them are kind of in the middle, and others are not rare pairs, but they're not as popular. I will not be doing every single permutation of every character's possible ship, because if I did, then I would be here for hours and... No, I can talk about shipping for a while, but not that long. These are the ones that I can actually provide commentary on. Also, obligatory disclaimer, since I know shipping in the Genshin community can be pretty intense and scary sometimes, just because I am discussing a ship, explaining why it exists and why it appeals to people, does not mean that I personally like or ship the pairing myself. I am merely lecturing on it. Just imagine you're in a really weird college class and you're good. With certain Genshin ships, you can land yourself in hot water for even mentioning the ship name. So, disclaimer. Don't shoot the messenger. This guide is meant to be taken as objectively as possible. I am simply explaining why a ship exists and why it appeals to people. I will not let my own personal bias of whether I like a ship or not touch this. I just want to keep this as clean and neat as possible. Like reading a recipe, explaining chemistry, if you will. All of the following has been gathered from the lore, character backstories, voice lines, events, and just lurking on Twitter for hours every day. <laughs> okay, enough talk. Let's set sail. Outfit change. Why are certain characters thrown together in the first place? There's a variety of reasons. Characters could have a lot of lore, backstories, history together. So from there, people can be like, oh, well, it makes sense if they got together. Then. It could also be because of potential. Like, oh, this character's like this, and this character's like this. If we were to put them in a bottle together and shake it around a bit, what would happen? Just some fun what-if scenarios. Or it could just be because they look cute together aesthetically. So yeah, a lot of options why people ship. And with the character roster this big, there's a lot of options to play around with. Got my notes here. She's a professional, everyone. Chili, the ship between Child and Zhongli. I know a lot of people switched from using Chili to Tartali because when you went to the Chili tag, it'd just be a mix of the actual ship with pictures of chili, the food. And I think it was done out of consideration for the poor souls who just wanted to look at chili recipes. Oops. So with this pair, you've got a lot of in-game content to build a foundation off of. The two are friends, business partners, child is with the Fatui that has an arrangement with the Wangsheng funeral parlor. They eat meals together frequently. Zhongli calls child a rascal. Even though child was upset when he found out that Zhongli was Rex Lapis, they still hang out. And child is like, yo, I wanna fight you one day, dude. And Zhongli is like, hey, if this guy's ever bothering you, then just let me know and I'll put him in line to the traveler. A lot of people joke that because Zhongli is heckin' broke and child is loaded, they have almost like a sugar daddy, sugar baby vibe going on. It's like, ah yes, this is my sugar baby, an ex-god that could probably kill me, a member of a criminal organization that buys all the stuff he wants. Zhongli also gifted child a pair of Dragon Phoenix chopsticks for him to practice with since child does not know how to use them, and in ancient China these were symbolic of a happy marriage symbolism. It's also funny because Child's food item is basically a pot of seafood and he loves to go fishing, whereas Zhongli hates seafood due to having to fight a bunch of sea monsters during the Archon War, so gotta work on that if they're together. You've got this playful, chatty, flirtatious, young gun sort of guy with this reserved, serious, calm, old man. And of course, they're both very attractive. Warning for this ship, though. Lots of monster f if you're not into that, then be warned. <laughs> Ito Goro, the ship between Ito and Goro. Ito views Goro favorably and admires his fighting spirit despite his small stature. He likes his vibe because it makes him feel understood and warm and fuzzy inside. Okay, bro. Ito is also a big fan of Miss Hina's advice column, which is actually Goro using an alias. You can have some hidden identity shenanigans with the ship. Both of them use Geo, which work really well together. Neither of them are entirely human, so you've got some cool contrasting looks as well. There's a height difference, a size difference. Yeah, a lot of this is built off of potential of what they could have together. Xiaobedo, the ship between Xiao and Albedo. No canon interactions with these two yet, we don't know if we will get that eventually, but this ship is based on speculation, what they could have. Both of them are serious, reserved characters with a dedication to their work, their jobs, and their storylines are quite similar to each other, almost parallel, because neither of them want to hurt or destroy 
those around them or those they love, despite them having the ability to do so. Their color schemes go well together, a lot of complementary colors going on, and they also have opposite elements. Visions, Geo and Animo. Lumber, or Lumber, the ship between Lumine and Amber. So these two interact a lot in the beginning of the game. You as the traveler meet Amber and she teaches you the ropes. She's basically the traveler's cheerleader. She's encouraging, she roots for them. So this ship is basically good friends to lovers. A lot of content with this pairing is just the two of them gliding around Mondstadt together, eating food at Good Hunters, and yet the idea of them always coming back to Mondstadt, to Amber, the first person that they met and the only person that really was interested in helping them find their sibling in the first place, that's heartwarming, man. <laughs> Ayamiya, the ship between Ayaka and Uemiya. The two have been featured in official art together. They work together when organizing firework festivals and events. The two are friends, so friends to lovers. You've got red and blue, gold eyes, blue eyes, fire and dice. Always those contrasting colors, man. It's just pleasing to the eye. Ayaka is also stated to be one of the few people that doesn't cut Uemiya off when she's talking, and she actually lets her finish speaking and isn't impatient with her. She's a good listener, and that's really sweet. Normalize listening to your partner talk. Very different personality and upbringing. So Mia is exuberant, energetic, talkative, and Ayaka is elegant, ladylike, pristine. So people like exploring Yoimiya opening Ayaka up and having her express herself, and Ayaka kind of acting like a calming blanket over Yoimiya. Sort of like, I can show you the world, fireworks explosion. Xiaovin, the ship between Xiao and Venti. I always want to say Xiaovin, like Sha'oven. <laughs> We've got a pair of immortals on our hands, both of them Animo. These two have not interacted in the game, but their pairing is built a lot on the lore. At some point in the past, the hatred that Xiao was trying to combat was threatening to take over his body, but Venti saved his life through playing a song on the flute that calmed and protected him from the hate. You can see this event being alluded to in Xiao's trailer where Venti is playing the flute and then it zooms over to Xiao watching. The two him. have very different personalities. Venti is loud, bubbly, frivolous, carefree, and Xiao is devoted to his duty of fighting evil and very reserved. Venti is out there with the people socializing, whereas Xiao is very reclusive. This ship is quite popular. People like seeing the two of them together with Venti getting all in Xiao's business and Xiao just trying to keep it cool. People like that Venti has the ability to help Xiao, calm him, heal him, and then Xiao could be a badass and just cut down anyone who gets in Venti's path. Not that Venti isn't capable of taking care of himself, he kicks ass too. It's kind of like, hi, I'm just gonna chuck some wine and toot 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 on my flute. Here's my scary boyfriend that will kick your ass. Xiao also has a voice line about Venti where he seems like he's almost gonna talk about how Venti saved him, but then he goes, forget it. Very similar color schemes and a lot of modern AUs for this pairing I've noticed. Jean Luke, the ship between between Jean and Dilu. I like Dean better. Why can't people just call it Dean? <laughs> These two have known each other since they were young and in the Knights of Avonius together. They both grew up in aristocratic families in Mondstadt. Currently, as they stand now, with Jean being the acting grandmaster of the Knights of Avonius, the organization that Diluc is very not on great terms with, and Diluc being the Dark Knight hero of Vigilante, they're kind of on opposing fronts on the surface, but Diluc has a lot of respect for Jean and says that her talents are wasted on the organization and just she does way too much for them. She's stuck being responsible with busy work where she could just be saving people like he is. And then Jean is just sad about Diluc's whole situation in the first place. So yeah, vigilante ex-officer of the law with their own senses of justice that don't quite aligned, but despite that, when the situation calls for it, they don't hesitate to work together. People like to joke that Klee is their love child because she looks like both of them. <laughs> both of them work too hard, so when you put them together, they have to force each other to just take it easy for a bit. A very intense couple that can bring out the little seeds of playfulness and softness in each other. Light and dark color schemes going on, and yeah, a shared history with potential for more in the future. Beneficial, the ship between Bennett and Fischl. I love this ship name so much, holy sh these two are stated to be good friends, and they're both part of the Adventurers Guild. They don't have any in-game interactions at the moment. We may be getting that in the future. Bennett has called her amazing and genuinely believes that she is a princess. She worries about him and his bad luck, and the two of them together are kind of like this outcast weird kids club. Bennett is also the only one that's able to pronounce her full title correctly. Even she butchers it sometimes. A lot of content with these two is just them going on adventures together, trying to deal with their idiosyncrasies. These are both kind of ostracized. A lot of scenarios play out where they understand each other and are very kind to each other as a result. Fischl is also kind of prickly on the outside, soft on the inside, and when you pair that with Bennett's just sunny disposition, it's cute. A lot of hurt, comfort, and fluff with these two, so if you're interested in just a couple of quirky kids going around town and taking care of business, then 
there you go, Toma Luke, the ship between Toma and Dilu. This started out as a rare pair and kind of a hypothetical ship, and then the snowball started rolling and it's actually getting pretty popular. There's no canon interactions between these two characters yet, but it's popular fanon that they knew each other when they were young since Toma grew up in Monster. People like to think the two were childhood friends playing together before Toma had to leave for Inazuma. Imagining the two coming back together as adults, seeing how time has changed them, and are you the same kid I once knew? Even though they both are Pyro, their personalities are quite different. Toma is Sunshine Incarnate and Diluc is an angsty boy. But they're both very passionate and there's speculation that Toma could bring out that playful side out of Diluc again. They're jokingly referred to as the ketchup and mustard pair I love that. Kind of like a cat dog ship, a lot of reconciling with the past and moving on together in the future, her comfort. And Toma does know of Jean and Eula, so it's not out of the question that he knows who D. Luke is either. Also, neither of them like alcohol. You found your grape juice soulmate, D. Luke. Lots and lots of childhood friends content, so if you love that trope, then here you go. Tomo Kazu, the ship between Kazuha and his yet to be named friend, but everyone calls him Tomo because Tomo means friend in Japanese. Alas, since since Tomo is not alive in the current storyline, this ship is based on what could have happened in the past, or maybe a canon divergence sort of scenario. For obvious reasons, this ship has a lot of angst potential. The two were very good friends and traveled together, trusted in one another. Katsuha is still mourning his friend's death, and when he blocks the Raiden Shogun sword from hurting the traveler in the Archon quest, you see his old friend's vision briefly light up. And then later on, he leaves his friend's vision at his gravesite. Kazuha stated that he wanted to know what his friend's expression was the moment he died. Yeah, this one hurts. If you want to focus solely on what happened in the past, then you just have a pair of sweet, carefree boys just traveling through Inazuma together. Friends to lovers, height difference, but yeah, get your tissue box ready. Or just focus solely on AUs. There's a lot of AUs out there that just circumnavigate the whole death thing. <laughs> People really like the we could have had it all sort of vibe with this pairing. Like what would have happened if Tomo didn't challenge the Raiden Shogun and he was still around with Kazuha and they were still just best buds. Or more than best buds. People like to interpret Tomo kind of teaching Kazuha to let loose a little bit. And they also take care of that cute little cat that Tomo has. Just softness to ease the pain of, you know, major character death. Guili, the ship between Guizhong and Zhongli. This one, like Tomokazu, is based solely in the past. Guizhong and Zhongli were friends during the Archon War, before it even. Guizhong is the god of dust, was the god of dust, and Zhongli is the rock. The two founded Guili Plains together, which is literally their ship name. It's said that she died amongst the glaze lily she loved so much, and Zhongli still has a very soft spot for those flowers to this day. They're the flowers associated with her and Zhongli's first meeting together. The two were dear friends. They worked together to try to improve the lives of Liyue's people. They had meals together with the Adepti. If you're a sucker for first loves, past loves, heartache, heartbreak, this is a good ship for that. A lot of angst. <laughs> Zhongguang, the pairing between Zhongli and Ningguang. These two haven't interacted directly with each other in the game, but they do know of each other. Zhongli referred to her as a rare gem when he was remembering when she was young and poor and selling her wares barefoot. He did visit her in a dream as Rex Lapis as well when he revealed that he wasn't actually dead to the chi sink. Both of them are Geo, which combos really well in game together and does a lot of damage. And there's a lot of speculation that Ningguang could be the reincarnation of Guizhong, who was Zhongli's ally and friend before and during the Archon War. They're lovingly referred to as Geo Mommy and Geo Daddy respectively. The two of them just look like a couple of rich business tycoons together. <laughs> Maya, the pairing between Toma and Ayaka. The two of them are incredibly close. Toma works for the Kamisato family. He's a loyal servant to them and is very devoted to Ayaka. He thinks highly of her, encourages her, spars with her. He also says that he wishes she would open up more. Ayaka also thinks very highly of Toma. She almost goes out and tries to rescue him from the Shogun herself until the Traveler convinces her to stay put and they'll go instead. So with them already being very close and seeing the potential for them to become more than friends, a lot of people really like that. It's the poor servant boy with the rich girl dynamic. Red and blue, fire and dice as well. She does stay that she sees Toma as family, which puts some people off, but shippers hold on to the fact that her feelings could change in the future, or she said that to convey how close the two of them are. It's just friends to lovers. Gorozuha, the pairing between Goro and Kazuha. That is a weird ship name to say. Gorozuha, Gorozuha. These two often fought side by side in battle. Battle buddies. Goro is the general of the resistance army that gave Kazuha sanctuary after his friend was killed.
killed by the Raiden Shogun. They're old friends, they fought against Kujo Sara together. Kazuha says that he likes people who speak their mind, which is in line with Goro, who he states speaks whatever's on his mind. Kazuha is Animo and Goro is Jiro, which are opposing elements, visions. They both have a very keen sense of justice and a keen sense of hearing as well. You cannot sneak up on these boys, no. <laughs> both have voice lines about liking to lay down in the sun and relax, and that led to a lot of head cannons where they take naps in the sun together, which is really cute. It's pretty much a, we've worked together in the past, we're good friends, why not take it up a notch? Just two soft fluffy boys. Chiluk, the ship between Child and Diluc. These two have not interacted yet, but Diluc despises the Fatui due to their role in his father's death. Meanwhile, Child is the youngest Fatui harbinger, and he spends a fair amount of time traveling around on Fatui business, so the chances of them meeting eventually are not slim. Very much an enemy's hate dynamic. It's unhinged, a little feral, very spicy. And they're both gingers. They likely would not like each other. Child would be fed up with Diluc's kind of stuffy personality, whereas Diluc hates the Fatui. That in combination with Child's playful, almost sleazy personality would just set him off. But even though it's very likely they wouldn't be fond of each other, people still enjoy putting them in a jar and shaking it. It's interesting too, seeing just how different they are on multiple fronts. For one, Child is Hydro and Diluc is Pyro. Lots of contrasts with the color palettes too. Even though they're both rich, Diluc inherited his wealth, whereas Child, it seems, got his by being a Fatui harbinger. And with family, it's a very contrasting theme for both of them. Diluc is estranged from Kaya, who he grew up with, and doesn't have any family really to speak of, whereas Child is absolutely dedicated to his family and dotes on his siblings, his brother to serve. So even with the initial friction from their demeanors and personalities, they likely would have even more turmoil knowing what's under the surface. What I would do to be a fly on the wall when they're fighting. Kather, the ship between Kaya and Aether. Kaya is one of the first characters you meet as the traveler when you're in Mondstadt. He has that delicious slow zoom up where you see his butt. And the two interact a lot. Kaya is constantly teasing the Traveler in his voice lines. He makes fun of Aether's height during the Windbloom Festival. And at some point, Aether also says it's hard to say no to Kaya's trademark smile. This pairing feels very similar to like a self-insert scenario because you are playing as the Traveler and Kaya's hot. He flirts a lot. There was a mini comic called Beware Kaya's Praise where Kaya showers Aether with compliments as he defeats Hilly Churls and Aether can be seen blushing with a bunch of flower graphics around him. There's the whole height difference thing going on, and there's also some spice to be taken into consideration when you think about Kaya's backstory and his potential as the Prince of Kynera. And Aether's sister is the Princess of the Abyss, which used to be Kynera, so potential conflict. Like all traveler pairings, this ship can be seen as controversial due to a lot of debate about Aether's age. But yeah, Kaya and Aether work together quite frequently with Kaya being cavalry captain and Aether as an honorary knight. And so a lot of fan works will be them just cutting down hilly churls and Kaya is trying to get a rise out of Aether who is doing his best not to react. Barbell, the ship between Barbara and Noel. I love the ship name for this too. It's really cute. Like they're both such sweet girls. And then you have this badass name like Barbell. No in-game interaction for these two yet, but they do know each other and are friends. Barbara actually calls Noelle the cutest and she says she's super kind and patient and you can feel relaxed around her. And Noelle says she loves spending time with Barbara. We have this hardworking maid night in training with the idol of Mondstadt. Both of them are sweet, dedicated, determined. Both of them are healers. And both of them admire Jean. Barbara loves her big sister and looks up to her and Noelle's like, oh my god, Jean is like my idol. They're set to take tea breaks together. Together. And this ship is just marshmallow fluff on a plate. If you want something soft, sweet, and wholesome, here you go. I just realized too, they both have really poofy skirts. Poofy skirt couple. Kokoro, the ship between Kokomi and Goro. You gotta hand it to some of these Genshin ships. Like, even if you don't ship it, you can still admire the name. For this ship, Goro is Kokomi's general in the Resistance. Kokomi recognizes Goro as an exceptional general who is sincere, determined, and courageous, while he states that she is an astute strategist and outwardly adores her. He holds her in very high regard, like almost on a platform. Friends to lovers is a common dynamic between these two, a lot of mutual pining. For the angstier folks, unrequited love is quite common between these two, with Goro having this hero worship of his leader only to have it not reciprocate. They work together, they trust in each other, and yet for some people, they like to play off of that difference in hierarchy, like, oh, I love her, I love him, but 
we kind of have this gap between us and a freaking war to win, so we're not going to do anything about it yet. If at all. Scarachi, or Scarachai, the ship between Scaramouche and Child. Ooh, this is a spicy one. <laughs> Both of them are Fatui Harbingers, but even though they're co-workers, they really don't like each other much. So with this ship, you have a lot of sort of hate going on. It's like, frick, you drive me insane. Let's go make out in the break room. There's that height and size difference, but Scaramouche is not to be taken lightly, and so a lot of people like to just have them bullying child. And you know, child being child, he's into it. Also some color contrasts going on. They're also Electro and Hydra respectively, which work really well together in game. But yeah, have yet to see official interactions together in the game, although obviously they do know of each other. Scarabedo, the ship between Scaramouche and Albedo. This one used to be more of a rare pair, but it's gained a lot of traction, so I'm gonna go ahead and put it in this video. The two have never met, but they both have a lot in common and some parallels going on. Neither of them are humans, they're both artificial life forms that were left behind by their creators, their masters. And they're both trying to find the truth of the world to that. It's cool though, because although they do have a lot of overlap, they have very different approaches to what happened to them and how they're going forward. Scatamouche resents I and kind of let that resentment fester after the Patui took him in. Whereas Albedo is at peace with his existence and found a home through the Knights of Avonius, Mondstadt, Klee. But yeah, despite appearances, they're not so different from each other if you look under the surface. They're aloof, collected, inquisitive, reclusive. That is, unless you piss off Scaramouche, in which... Ruh -ruh. So for a lot of people who like this ship, it's just a matter of how would they get along if we put them in a room together? And yeah, some different color schemes and aesthetics going on too. Both of their voices are very nice as well. Qingguang, the ship between Keqing and Ningguang. The two are co-workers. They work together as part of the Liyue Qixing. And they're opposites personality-wise. Ningguang is teasing. I don't know how to describe her other than like hot syrup, like very... Ooh. <laughs> Whereas Keqing is like, I want to see things done right. She considers Ningguang a comrade in arms. And when you put the two of them together with their respective skills, they could probably take over the world. Very much a sort of pairing where it's the hot mommy type put together with the uptight smaller type. Ningguang is just trying to loosen Keqing up a bit and get her to react. Definitely can see some modern corporate AUs with this pairing. Toma Lumi, the ship between Toma and Lumi. So these two spend a lot of time together when the traveler first comes to Inazuma. Throughout the whole Archon quest, he's there. They save each other's lives a couple times. People like to imagine scenarios where sweet, playful Toma can bring Lumi out of her shell more. Toma teaches her housekeeping skills to varying levels of success, and he says that he enjoys the Traveler's company. The Traveler also gives Toma pinwheel asters from Mondstadt because they know that he was raised there, and he calls that an invaluable gift. He then gives the Traveler his omamori for good luck. Very wholesome ship. The dynamic is the Traveler just kicking ass as they do, and Toma's like, you're doing great, sweetie, as he's cleaning the house. Almona, the ship between Albedo and Mona. What happens when you pair an alchemist with an astrologist? With these two, they're both seeking the truths of their world to that using their own fields and knowledge. They want to unveil to that secrets, and Mona will actually have lunch with Klee and Albedo sometimes, and that's where they will exchange information. There's a lot of potential and foreshadowing of them working together in the future, and lots of related and intertwined lore in terms of their masters. Both both of their masters knew Alice, Klee's mother and a famous adventurer. And through their masters, they both have ties to Kainur. Albedo is a homunculus that was created by the art of Chemia, which originated in Kainura. Kainura, what the f***? And Mona's master has connections to this group of mages, sorcerers that explore the ley lines and petrified trees that root down into the abyss. Kind of. I had no clue about this initially. I had to look this up in her backstory. So yeah, if the story is going where we think it's going, then these two are going to be meeting up a lot more frequently in the future. And it's funny trying to imagine them having to have these intellectual discussions where Mona maybe gets pissy at Albedo when he's like, um, actually. Kazuskara, the ship between Kazuha and Skaramush. I've seen this lovingly referred to as the hobo ship. Both of them are vagrants from Inazuma with ties to the Raiden Shogun, and people like to imagine scenarios where they meet and how they would interact with each other. A lot of what fueled the ship in the beginning has since been proven false, but this ship was built upon lore speculation where people were thinking that Skatamush could be Kazuha's old friend that he was separated from. There was a pretty big theory in the past where the messages in bottles floating in Dragon Spine were the two trying to communicate with each other. This has since been proven not true. But there was a reveal in the Violet Garden event that Scaramouche was the one who led Kazuha's family clan 
to its downfall. Kazuha stated that he will not turn a blind eye to the person who basically destroyed his clan, and even though they aren't aware of each other presently, they could very well face off in the future. It's definitely an enemies to lovers sort of thing. Contrasting aesthetics, and I have seen content where Skatamush is going full bully on Kazuha, just teasing him, throwing insults, and Kazuha's just trying to keep it together. Red eyes, blue eyes, light hair, dark hair. Destined enemies, if you will. Then Lumi, the ship between Venti and Lumi. Lots of interactions at the beginning of the game. We run into Venti when he is chatting up with Devalin. We help him with that whole quest and stealing the Holy Liar. He's very affectionate with the Traveler and the two have a connection as it's implied that they've met in the past, although the Traveler does not remember. There's a whole exchange during the Wind Bloom Festival where they're talking about the meaning of wind blooms. Flowers of blessings, flowers of respect, flowers of love. Lumi then says that she enjoys the feeling of freedom and Venti pulls a Han Solo and goes, I know, the old god and the wandering traveler. This one is not controversial so much as people find it odd because both the Traveler and Venti kind of have debates about their ages going on. And yeah, just a lot of content of Venti up to his usual shenanigans of tomfoolery and the Traveler just having to bail him out of trouble. They both just have so much baggage from their pasts, their very long pasts, and they're just trying to move forward one day at a time. Dane K, the ship between Danslev and Kaya. These two have not met in the game yet, surprisingly. <laughs> so this ship is built off of a lot of lore speculation and both their histories to Kynir. Danslev was part of the royal guard that failed to protect the royal family and Kaya could very well be the prince of Kainara. So you have the whole sort of knight servant ex royalty situation. It can be really angsty. People want to see them reunite and navigate the world together as remnants of a world long past. Do they actually know each other? We don't know. It's possible, but we don't know. It is funny and a little sus though that the two characters confirmed from Kainara have not interacted or even seen each other Maybe yet. Mihoyo is holding on to that dramatic reveal for the future. Diluvin, the ship between Diluc and Venti. Rich Fuddy Duddy meets poor Carefree Bard. This pairing is based off of lore, their canon interactions, their dynamic with each other. Venti is Barbados, Mondstadt's god of freedom, and Diluc is nicknamed the unnamed king of Mondstadt. He's also one of the few people who knows Venti's identity as Barbados. Venti canonically steals food from the Dawn Winery and also mooches wine off of Diluc all the time. And Diluc plays bartender at the Angel Share sometimes. And so you have this drunk who's just putting down wine like no one's business. And Diluc is like, please stop. I have a business to run. He does mention at some point that he doesn't charge Venti because his tab would be astronomical. Diluc also collects counterfeits of an artifact called Barbados Breath to ensure the Fatui don't get their hands on it. So there are some fan scenarios where Venti just walks in on Diluc's collection of Barbados Breath and he's like, dude, if you wanted the real thing, you could have just told me. Venti did know Diluc's ancestor who helped rebel against Decorabi and the Tyrant from Monsat's past. This pairing does have sugar daddy, sugar baby vibes going on with Venti just milking Diluc for all he's worth and Diluc just sighing. <laughs> there is angst potential in this pairing in that Venti is immortal but Diluc is not and reincarnation is a common theme because Venti did have ties to Diluc's ancestor. Like some other Venti pairings, this ship can be seen as controversial due to Venti's status as a shapeshifting immortal whose current appearance is kind of ambiguous. But yeah, wine-loving god of Mondstadt with Mondstadt's unnamed king who owns a winery. Zhongven, the ship between Zhongli and Venti. These two are the last OG Archons, so they have a lot of history together and know each other quite well. A common thing between these two is that Venti will be just driving Zhongli up the wall and then Zhongli's trying his best to not snap. Venti calls him an old blockhead, Zhongli calls him a disgrace to the arts. He even threatens to beat him up after he gets the traveler drunk, which that that's pretty funny. <laughs> these two are completely complete opposites down to the elements they control, Animo and Geo respectively. From their personalities, to their aesthetics, to how they handled themselves as gods in the past, Venti is as carefree as the breeze, whereas Shongli is pretty rigid and grounded. But now both of them are retired, gnosisless. Gnosisless, that's a weird word to say. So when you put them together, there's a lot of old married couple vibes going on. But they're both immortals, so whether they like it or not, they're going to be stuck together for a long time. Some people joke that Xiao looks like a mix of the two, so there's some AUs out there where like their parents and Xiao is their very disgruntled emo teenager. But some people aren't comfortable with this ship because of the way Venti looks in game. He's immortal, very old, and can change his form to whatever he wants, but 
the way he normally looks. How old is that exactly? So yeah, this ship can kind of be seen as controversial. Venti, why do you make things so complicated? Scaramona, the ship between Scatamouche and Mona. This pairing is based off of their interactions from the Unreconciled Stars event. Scatamouche is going off about how the stars are a lie, which pisses Mona off as an astrologist. And then she calls him a scumbag. Both have the theme of fate pretty ingrained in their characters, with Scatamouche mentioning the fact that he is a human, free to make his own choices, got no string style, whereas Mona treats fate as something that can be read and is unchangeable. It is essentially enemies to lovers, people like looking into this relationship and just going, oh my god, they're both such mean this is toxic, I love it. Bickering and fighting is a big part of their shtick. I've also seen a fair amount of content where he plays reluctant sugar daddy to Mona, who is broke. They are the big hat couple, short king with his astrology geo. Very similar color schemes going on as well, both with their hair, their eyes, the blacks and purples and blues. And it is quite likely that they'll see each other again in the future. Yan Tao, the pairing between Yan Fei and Hu Tao. The pyro girls with funky hats. The two haven't interacted in game, but they do know of each other. Yan Fei is one of the few people that respects Hu Tao's profession. She actually complains that she wants Hu Tao to come to her more frequently for legal advice. Some people liken it to bubbling from Adventure Time. I can kind of see it. Both are very fun characters. They have a good synergy and chemistry going on with their similar personalities. Lots of potential for banter, playing around with each other. And pyro resonance as well. They fight really well together with Yanfei's shield and Hu Tao's HP depletion. <laughs> Hu Tao is mischievous and you know she's going to be mischievous and you think that Yanfei would be the one to rein her in, but secretly Yanfei's kind of encouraging it. Yunyan, the pairing between Yunjin and Xinyan. Classical musician meets rock star. Yunjin is actually a fan of Xinyan who has to keep her love of rock and roll on the down low because her elders don't approve. She apparently visits Xinyan's shows three times a week and has actually been invited to her home as a guest before. This ship screams, she was a punk, she did ballet. What more can I say? Apparently the creators of the characters themselves have stated that they have a very deep bond with each other. Totally opposite aesthetics, but they're still great friends. Just imagine a scene of this elegant girly girl cheering her heart out for this girl in studs and leather on stage. Their personalities are quite different from each other as well in terms of how they present themselves to the public versus how they actually feel on the inside. Yunjin looks super refined and graceful, but she will totally let loose at Xinyan's concerts and just full fangirl mode. Whereas Xinyan may appear super passionate and wild and kind of intimidating, she's actually very soft and sweet. We may be different, but we're quite complementary to each other. Ganting, the ship between Ganyu and Kechi. And they were co-workers. And friends. Both of them work for the Liu Ei Qixing, although they do have opposing viewpoints in regards to Rex Lapis. Kechi has stated time and time again that she wants Liu Ei to move past the need for the Adepti, whereas Ganyu is an adept die. But after the Archon quest and later in the story, they do understand each other better. And they do respect each other. Ganyu has said that she always saw Keqing as a kind, considerate person, which makes Keqing fluster. And during the moon chase event, she asked for others to take good care of Keqing for her. The traveler then commented that it makes her sound like Keqing's big sister. That's just what the traveler says though. The two look very good together with the light purple and the light blue going on. Their dynamic is kind of spicy and sweet, Firm versus gentle, uptight and intimidating versus quiet and tired. Happy Crows, the ship between Albedo and Sucrose. These two have a lot going on. They have co-workers, work friends, professor assistant, science buddies. Sucrose really respects and admires Albedo as a scientist, and Albedo likes her dedication and pleasant nature, but bemoans her stubbornness. Lots of in-game interactions between these two and official art due to them working together. And Albedo actually gifted her a wind bloom during the festival. Lots of little details in this pairing that people love. Albedo, like like sweet food and Sucrose's name is literally sugar. Albedo is said to be prince-like, it's literally in his name, and Sucrose has a fondness for fairy tales. Fan content between these two has a lot of pining involved typically on Sucrose's end, but they gotta take turns being the responsible one because both of them kind of get tunnel vision when they're doing their science stuff. To Lumi, the ship between child and Lumi. Hey girly, hold still. Flirt. So lots of canon content for these two. Their initial meeting was when Child saves Lumin from the Millilith as they're sneaking around, kind of guiding the Traveler through the Archon quest and then eventually them fighting each other with Child unleashing his foul legacy transformation. Kind of an enemies to lovers thing going on, more like frenemies. There's good girl, bad boy, hero and villain, size difference, fighting as a love language. In the Genshin anthology story, a stroll with Monoceros Ky Kylie? Sorry. The two actually go on a date child bribes Paimon to leave them alone. They end up fighting. Lumin kicks his ass and then goes, oh, this date wasn't too bad. In the Labyrinth Warriors event, he has a voice line where he goes, you're like the stars in the night sky, comrade. You never cease to surprise me. People like to say that Lumin keeps child's life interesting as someone who was just kind of 
bored in the monotony of Fatui business. I always feel that having you around is what makes life really interesting. If you have no special plans, how about you swing by my place, is what he says in his birthday mail. In Child Story Quest, the Traveler also promises Child that they'll visit them in Shesnaya. A lot of content is just the Traveler putting Child in his place and Child being a little too into it. Like other Traveler pairings, this ship can be seen as controversial due to debate about Lumine's age. The Traveler runs into Child a lot throughout the story, so Lord knows when we'll see him next. There is a lot of tension between the two. How you want to interpret that is up to you. Yul Amber, the ship between Eula and Amber. You've got red and blue, fire and ice, opposite personalities. They're co-workers, they're both part of the Knights of Avonius. Amber is also one of the few to see Eula for who she really really is, rather than her bad family history. For context, Eula is part of the Lawrence clan who in the past acted as oppressors in Old Mondstadt. Amber is very kind towards Eula, roots for her, cheers for her, and she has a voice line about wanting to make a decent moon pie, which is Eula's specialty dish. The two of them used to eat a lot together at Good Hunters, and when Paimon calls out their close relationship, Eula gets super embarrassed. When doppelganger Albedo was wrecking havoc, Eula protected Amber from some falling rocks, and People went nuts over this image. And then of course we have Eula's character trailer where she's dancing the tango, Amber walks in and asks her what she's doing, and then Eula invites her to join her. Have a dance with the sinner, it takes two to tango. It's sunshine child with prickly pear on the outside, super gooey on the inside. Cute ex sexy, long hair, ex short hair, you get the picture. Ito Sara, the ship between Ito and Kujo Sara. These two have a childhood friends and rivals dynamic going on. In their youth, the two had a fight that led to Ito having a pretty bad tumble down a hill after which Sada was the one to carry him back into town on her back. Even back then, they were rivals. Childhood rivals, to current rivals, to lovers? Neither of them have realized, though, that their current rival is their old one. How many Tengu and Onis are out there? Sada then takes away his vision after a challenge, and he's determined to have a rematch, revenge duel with her, much to her chagrin. He also invited her to join his gang prior to their duel. And his gang is known to invite misfits, and Sada has always felt a bit ostracized due to her Tengu heritage. Sada states that he is the noisiest person she's ever met. He keeps leaving up all these bulletin board messages trying for a rematch, and Miku is so tickled by their dynamic that she insists on having their bulletin board exchanges left up for entertainment. This pairing just screams himbo and is goth GF. You're stupid. I like that in a man. It's the affection idiot and the tsundere. Their meals and taste preferences even complement each other. He likes sweet food, which Sada has, and she likes quick filled meals, which he has. Some have called it an unhealthy dynamic due to Ito constantly demanding that Sada fight him, but others argue that Sada is perfectly capable of handling herself, and if she really was that bothered, she would have taken care of it already. It is also heavily implied that Ito is the descendant of Irakura Dokai, the Oni, and Sada is the descendant of Turiyo the Tengu. I tried my best to pronounce those. And those two were rival lovers. Xiaother, the pairing between Xiao and Aether. As the Traveler, Aether interacts with Xiao a lot. We first meet him during the Archon quest where we have to coax him out with some almond tofu. And when the two first meet at Wangshu Inn, the song Lover's Oath plays. During the big Jade Chamber battle, Xiao saves Aether from falling off the platforms. During the Lantern Rite event, Aether tries to get Xiao to attend the festivities and after Xiao insists that he doesn't want to go, he decides to bring the festivities to Xiao. Xiao also promises Aether that if he calls his name, he will be there to help. In Xiao's letter for his birthday, Xiao states that he decided he would find a crystal fly for Aether because he thought it would look nice in his hair, and then ends up catching Ted. Aether is also one of the few who can actually be around Xiao without having to worry about his karma. Lots of people like to think that Aether can show Xiao the sweeter sides of life and really get him to be happy again, he can help appease his suffering and trauma a little. And Xiao is very willing to protect Aether. This pairing is pretty much sun and moon. Like most pairings involving the Traveler, this ship can be seen as controversial due to debate about Aether's age. Both of these characters can use Animo, and they both are immortal? Question mark? Lots of her comfort with this pairing, and it's mainly about just Aether slowly bringing Xiao out of his shell and showering him with gentle love and affection. Albether, the pairing between Albedo and Aether. Very big sun and moon vibes going on, with Aether being the sun and Albedo being the moon. Aether, as a traveler not of this world, fascinates Albedo, who then has him help with experiments. Performing experiments together. <laughs> Albedo states that he knows he can count on Aether for whatever he needs. If one day I lose control, destroy Mondstadt, destroy everything, 
Can I rely on you to stop me? I'm certain we will have many opportunities to be alone in the future. Albedo, dude, come on. <laughs> Lots of jokes for him simping for the traveler. Aether is also the only person besides Paimon that Albedo trusts enough to tell the secret of his origin to. In the Shadows Amidst Snowstorms event, Albedo states that he is a perfect rose and Aether is his gardener. The only person in the world who can tell the difference between him and his doppelgangers. Sweet analogy, bro. Lots of fan content with them involve Albedo doing experiments with Aether. <laughs> Just learning about each other. There's also content where Aether will help take care of Albedo because Albedo is very bad at it and is a workaholic. A good amount of modern AUs, specifically college AUs for this pairing. Although this ship involves the Traveler, I don't believe it's considered very controversial. Maybe it is, I just haven't seen much debate surrounding it. There's a lot of gray area with ships involving Venti, the Traveler, Xiao, and Albedo. People like to interchange the four of them together, and some are more controversial than others. And it's just a big question mark, honestly. <laughs> Haibedo, the ship between Kaya and Albedo. Haibedo is basically co-workers to lovers. They're both part of the Knights of Avonius, Albedo is the chief alchemist, and Kaya is cavalry captain, and they both have ties to Kainur. Albedo is a homunculus that was created by the art of Kimia, which was Kainura's bread and butter, and Kaya is Kainura's last hope. These two sort of have an opposites attract thing going on. Albedo is reserved, studious, kind of reclusive. Kaya is flirtatious, bit of playboy vibes going on, and socializing, knowing people is his shtick. They both are kind of mysterious in their origins. A lot of their backstory and the lore surrounding them is shrouded in mist. He's got similar color schemes with the blues and whites and golds, as well as a height difference, and both of them help take care of Klee. Kaya has a voice line about Albedo where he's talking about how well-loved he is amongst the people, and he goes, what, are you into him as well? Meanwhile, Albedo's line about Kaya is just him low-key roasting him going oh yeah i could draw kai with like three lines albedo also worries that one day he'll lose control and destroy mondstadt and people joke that if kaya is indeed kainara's last hope then they can destroy mondstadt together power couple many scenarios involving these two often include kaya just being his usual self badgering albedo trying to get a rise out of him and albedo's just nonplussed taking notes doing his experiments like uh-huh yeah okay well if you're gonna help then help but if not then leave it's also a pairing that can be unexpected for a lot of characters in a the game they're like oh Albedo and Kaya, huh? Chaya, the ship between Child and Kaya. The potential for chaos within this ship is high. It's the epitome of double bubble toil and trouble. It's putting two F-boy-esque characters who are playful, flirtatious, kind of like, <laughs> with each other and then shaking them up and seeing what they can do. They don't have any interactions with each other yet, but they both have ties to the abyss. With these two, they kind of have a sort of spicy enemies to lovers dynamic, maybe not quite enemies. Child is a Fatui Harbinger and Kaya is Calvary Captain, so they're already kind of at odds with the organizations they work with. It's like, oh, we're technically on opposite sides and I don't necessarily like like you, but it's really fun chatting with you. Maybe more than chatting. Many encounters between these two in fan works involve them having to just talk business politics together and they're like, no, 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 we'll keep it professional. And then it hard cuts to them in bed with each other like, oh sh Child is Hydro and Kaya is Cryo, which work really well together in game. And they can be drinking buddies because they both enjoy alcohol. When envisioning these two together, they have kind of a Mr. and Mrs. Smith thing going on where they're flirting as they're trying to kill each other. Tomato, the ship between Toma and Ayatol. I love these ship names. It's just like food. So Toma is the Kamisato family's housekeeper and a very good friend to Ayatol. It is implied that Ayatol was the one who inspired Toma to the point where he actually received a vision. After Ayatol's parents die, Toma decides to stay with the family and Ayato is very grateful for this. He is one of the few people that Ayato trusts completely as someone who is constantly dealing with corruption and people who are after him. Ayato states that he values obedience and loyalty above all else, which he says are qualities that he sees in Toma. Ayato also pawns off all his weird food to Toma they have opposite color schemes going on. Toma is pyro and Ayato is hydro. It's kind of like a servant, master, poor boy, rich boy sort of dynamic. The idea of this ship tickles me. It's like Toma is this sweet, naive, good boy who's being seduced by this mischievous, stressed out of his mind aristocrat. Boba, milk tea is also a big part of this. It's just Ayato horking down as much boba as he can and Toma's like, no, 
Stop! Oma is Ayatul's babysitter, confirmed. <laughs> the two are great friends, very close, have a history together, lots of canon interactions. I can see them embodying pretty much every Shiba Inu meme out there, like their dog couple. Changcho, the ship between Chongyun and Xingqiu. These two have a lot of in-game content and official art together. Xingqiu refers to himself as Chongyun's dearest friend, while Chongyun remarks to the traveler that they should form a victims of Xingqiu squad. <laughs> Although Xingqiu likes to tease and prank Chongyun a lot, they're besties. Chongyun admires his dedication to chivalry and reading, and Xingqiu states that the two of them understand each other quite well. They can really be themselves around each other. It's best friends to lovers. According to Xiangling, the two eat together at Wanmin restaurant a lot. Xingqiu will also pay the damages for whatever Chongyun ends up doing when he is in his Yang-fueled episodes after he eats spicy food, which Xingqiu often will give to him. Chongyun is also the only one who really gets his weird sense of humor as well. They have friendship tassels together, and their fighting styles are quite complementary to one another. Xingqiu actually reads a romance novel to Chongyun during the Moon Chase Festival event called Young and Hopelessly Smitten. Bit on the news there, buddy. Lots and lots of pining between the two in fan works. Every flavor of pining, honestly. Mutual pining, one-sided pining, Pining, unrequited pining to oh wait no not actually unrequited pining and first love is a big theme as well. Sarakomi, the ship between Kujo Sara and Kokomi. So this one can be considered enemies to lovers due to them being on opposite ends of a war. Sara acknowledges Kokomi as a brilliant strategist and Kokomi compliments Sara's fighting prowess. When the two were negotiating peace there was some tension for which Sara apologized but Kokomi just laughed it off and said I have every confidence in our ability to resolve the situation. And then after that everything went smoothly. Sara confesses that she hopes the two will stay civil and that way they don't have to go back to fighting. Kokomi gives her some advice on how to fight the Fatui. Yep, just two characters with a mutual respect and admiration for each other eventually falling in love. There's a height difference between the two. Hydro and Electro pair really well together. Aesthetically, they can be really cute. You've got the girly girl GF with the badass GF. And there's a lot of potential for angst as well. Like maybe at some point they do have feelings for each other and they want to be together, but due to their respective responsibilities and their leadership roles, they can't. They're on opposite ends of a conflict and maybe they just have to stay on those opposite ends. Ai Sara, the ship between the Raiden Shogun and Kujo Sara. A lot of people like to joke that Sara is a Raiden Shogun fangirl. I mean, canonically, she does have five statues of her in her home for crying out loud. Even though she doesn't like the Raiden Shogun's cruelty, she still obeys her. She's still her loyal general. We don't know why she's exactly. There's probably some backstory there, but hasn't been revealed yet. The biggest eye simp. They've got the ruler and loyal general dynamic going on, but a lot of people in fan works like to kind of play off of Sada's devotion and make it a one-sided love. Unrequited pining, we love to see it. Before the whole eye thing is revealed, the Raiden Shogun is implied to really value Sada as a general and subordinate, but maybe not care for her exactly. This one can be really heartbreaking if you play your cards right. Oof, that angst. Maybe after it's all said and done, I can show some compassion and kindness towards Sara, and Sara maybe won't know what to do exactly. It might be too much for her to handle. Aimiko, the pairing between the Raiden Shogun and Yaimiko. These two have a lot of history together. They're old friends and allies. They're the sexy, sparky girls, because they're both Electro. It sounds even lamer when I say it out loud. <laughs> the two used to be very close. Miko actually was the one in possession of Ai's Gnosis after she cut ties with Celestia. And when the Traveler goes to her, she says, I'm placing my god in your capable hands for my sake and for Inazuma's, Please bring her back. A lot of people were joking that towards the end of the Shogun's leg of the Archon quest, they felt like a third wheel when the two were talking. Lots of ex-lover vibes going on. The two are quite playful with one another and tease each other. Their personalities are quite different, but they both have this thing with eternity. I mean, Eyes is obvious, and Miko is a fox spirit, so she's immortal. We've got pastel versus dark color schemes going on, pink and purple. And this absolutely tickled me, but Miko oversaw distribution for a light novel called Pretty Please Kitsune Guji. It's about a shrine maiden named... Yai Misako, be more subtle than that, <laughs> who gives the Raiden Shogun this drink called Rainbow Aster that she feeds her mouth to mouth. It's basically self-insert fanfiction. People like the dynamic of two best friends who like each other but aren't going to say anything anytime soon. Like Miko's being super obvious and Aya's like, oh, 
Couldn't be me though. Yayato, the ship between Yaimiko and Ayato. These two are business partners and they work very well together. Both of them are kind of snaky, charismatic, mischievous types. Very similar personality wise. Birds of a feather flock together. People really like the pink and blue aesthetic going on, the pastel couple. They're also known as cotton candy. They know each other quite well and Ayato is one of the few people that Miko cannot predict. They're just foxy foxes with him being him and her being a literal fox. When you put them together, she has all these wild wacky ideas and he has the power to execute them. But you don't know what they're planning either. Like they'll be super sweet to your face and like, oh yes, things are going quite according to plan. And then next thing you know, the buildings explode. There has been some friction with this ship and other Yaimiko ships because a lot of people do headcanon her as just liking girls. But yeah, this is one pairing that will definitely keep you on your toes. Sans Lumi, the ship between Danslave and Lumi. When I think of this ship, I immediately think of Olivia Rodrigo's song, Traitor. My memory has all but faded but I will always remember how much she too loved these flowers. These two were formerly traveling partners before Lumin became Princess of the Abyss. Sanslave despises the Abyss Order, so you can imagine there's some tension, but it is clear that he cared about her to some capacity. He thinks about her quite frequently. He compared the Traveler to her. When he sees her for the first time in God knows how long, he chases after her. It's just a very angsty ship. We have yet to learn more about the details between these two, but the dynamic is very much lovers to enemies. Shenjin, the ship between Shenhe and Yunjin. Shenhe's whole childhood is the inspiration for Yunjin's father's play, Divine Damsel of Devastation. But after Yunjin learned more about Shenhe, she actually went and changed the opera to honor the truth of Shenhe's life. Yunjin hopes that Shenhe will never feel alone again and be able to have true friendship. Lots of people like the color contrast between the two, the height difference. They're quite an elegant, pretty pair together, very graceful. Like you take a look at them and no matter how nice you're dressed, you suddenly feel like a slob. In fan works, the interactions between the two are very gentle, soft. In the story as well, Shenhe is able to have comfortable social interaction while attending Yunjin's plays. Fenzer, the ship between Bennett and Razor. These two are good friends through the Adventurer's Guild. They cook an adventure together. Bennett cooks meat for Razor and Razor in exchange teaches him about how wolves communicate. Bennett is Pyro and Razor is Electro, which work really well together in combat. The two of them also get trapped together during the Windbloom Festival event. In this event, Razor also reviews Bennett's love letter to which he says, don't understand words, but feel warm, tingly, like, Wolf Hook Thorn. Bennett did good poem. The recipient of this poem was never revealed. These two kind of have an opposites attract thing going on with Bennett being super energetic, happy-go-lucky, chatty, while Razor is more quiet, doesn't talk much. Both of them are kind of outcasts, so weird kids club. A lot of the content is just fluffy, wholesome good boys going on adventures together. Rosaya, the pairing between Rosaria and Kaya. These two are good friends and drinking buddies. They both have dealings with Mondstadt's seedy underbelly. They are the sussy sexy pair. That's why their boobs are so big. They're full of secrets. They've got opposing color schemes going on. She's more of like goth punk sort of vibes. He's kind of like, how would you describe Kai's aesthetic? Hardcore? <laughs> They're both very hot. They exude Jesse and James energy. It's like by GF and by BF. She's one of the few who have seen Kaya drunk and can see through the facade of his charisma. And yeah, they both help protect Mondstadt in their own mysterious ways. They're the type of couple where if you saw them in a mall, you'd feel extremely intimidated and very turned on. Kaluk, the ship between Kaya and Diluc. So these two were raised together with Kaya being unfortunately abandoned by his father at the Don Winery. We don't know how old he was when he was taken in, but he was aware of the fact that he had a mission to do. He was Kainara's last hope. There's the whole angsty backstory of Diluc's father getting critically injured after using a Fatui delusion and then Diluc had to mercy kill him. And then Kaya that night decided to reveal himself as a spy for Kainara. The two had a a deadly battle in which Kaya received his vision. Diluc then left Monset behind to trail after the Fatui and Kaya took his place as cavalry captain at some point. Diluc spent three years away and then came back and since then the two have worked together. And they're civil. They're not quite on reconciliation terms but they're civil. Diluc left behind his vision when he went after the Fatui and Kaya returned it to him in this ornamental vase that Diluc still keeps at the winery. People really want them to just get along again, have a proper reunion. Currently, they're still kind of turbulent with each other, but they do have a lot of in-game interactions and their stories are very much tied together. Lots of opposing themes for these two, blue and red, ice and fire. Kaya loves alcohol, Diluc despises it. Lots of angst too, but also her comfort, getting to know each other again. They're both very different from how they were in their youth. Diluc is serious, grumpy, 
has a very different sense of justice and Kaya uses his charm as a mask to hide how he's really feeling. Depending on the language and region you're playing in, there's a lot of back and forth about the nuances of the relationship. It is seen as controversial due to the sworn brothers versus adopted brothers argument. With the sworn brothers thing, they don't see each other as actual brothers, it's just they're dedicated to each other, whereas the adopted brothers thing, they're still siblings despite not being related by blood. Regardless about whether people see it as platonic or romantic, they just want the two to make up. Hu Xiao, the ship between Hu Tao and Xiao. These two have not interacted in the game, but they do know of each other. Xiao thinks she's funny and is one of the few people to view her and her profession in a favorable light. Both of them have butterfly motifs woven in their stories as well. Their personalities are quite different. Xiao is aloof, kind of intimidating, stoic, whereas Hu Tao is exuberant, happy, playful. But despite that, both of their jobs involve death and keeping the people of Liyue safe from evil spirits and demons. Death itself is a very big theme between the two, with both of them dealing with it in similar but different ways. Hu Tao sees death as something that is natural, inevitable, and something that shouldn't be feared. Everyone goes through it and moves on from it. Xiao sees it as redemption, a release, something that maybe isn't quite attainable for him. Hu Tao's voice line about Xiao implies that she knows more about him than maybe meets the eye. She says her knowledge on him is top secret. They have very similar gameplay styles with both of them using pole arms and they both have skills that deplete their HP. Opposite color schemes going on and their dynamic is very much energetic GF and goth BF. Also kind of sad if you think about it more because Xiao is immortal but Hu Tao is not. So if they were to get together and she eventually dies, she would likely be at peace with it but he wouldn't be. Xiao Yu, the ship between Xiao and Gan Yu. Both of them are mortal adepti that fought in the Archon War alongside Rex Lapis, and they do interact in game during Gan Yu's story quest, where she's trying to get more in touch with her adepti side after spending so long amongst humans. In her voice lines, she actually states that she's hesitant to partner up with them due to all his previous partners perishing, but he does help her train with her abilities, and he understands her as someone who is straddling two worlds. Her comfort is a very big theme between these two. They both have a lot of baggage. During their training, Xiao has a line where he says, the trial I've prepared for you will explore the true potential of your body. People ran with it. This pairing is just very soft, despite them having so much violent history. Some people do prefer to see them as more familial versus romantic. A lot of the fan works involving these two just consist of Ganyu being her sweet, reliable, gentle self, and Xiao not knowing how to handle it. I've seen some cute stuff where he gives her flowers and her being part goat just Chomp some. It almost feels like an old-fashioned love in a rapidly changing world. Barbian, the ship between Barbara and Xinyan. The famous music celebrity couple with Xinyan being a rock star and Barbara being an idol. They haven't met in canon, but people love the potential they have together. For one, you've got their opposite color schemes and elements with Barbara being Hydro and Xinyan being Pyro. But despite the fact they seem so different from each other, they're actually quite similar. They're both just sweet girls who want to bring joy to those around them. And they both like spicy food. A lot of fan content about these two is basically about them duetting, finding love in music, and each other. Very sweet ship. I like to refer to them as the pigtail pair as well. Jean Lisa, the ship between Jean and Lisa. These two are both characters you meet towards the start of the game, and they're both part of the Knights of Avonius. Jean is stated to almost blindly trust Lisa, and Lisa, who hates doing any type of work, is set to go out of her way to help Jean when she needs it. She states that Jean is a very gifted and dedicated leader, whereas Jean can let loose and relax around Lisa when normally she's so formal and serious around others. Lisa, and I quote, cannot turn down a request from Jean. In the manga, Jean states that when Lisa is around, I always have a peace of mind. The two are very close friends, opposite sort of personalities going on. Lisa can help take care of Jean when her workaholic tendencies overwhelm her and Jean can find solace in Lisa. We've got the knight and the witch. Funnily enough, a lot of married couple vibes coming off of them as well. And they're both absolutely gorgeous. Beiguang, the ship between Beidou and Ningguang. These two have a good amount of interactions with each other as well as a lot of intertwined backstories. There's the aesthetic differences between them, light versus dark. Based on looks, you've got bad girl x rich girl. You've got wild, reckless pirate mama x fancy, bougie, luxurious mama. The two kind of have a friendly rivalry going on. Beidou is just out there doing whatever the heck she wants and Ningguang's like, hey, 
gotta follow the rules. But Bedel is the only person besides the Traveler who can come and go out of the Jade Chamber as she pleases. When she isn't out exploring the high seas, Ningguang will summon her to the Jade Chamber and they'll play chess and have meals together. Although their taste in food is the exact opposite from one another, I think Bedel actually says that she wouldn't be caught dead eating out of Ningguang's bowl. Some people like to joke that Kazuha is their child because he looks a lot like Ningguang but is working with Bedel. Bedel is Electro and Ningguang is Geo and there's a saying that lightning is always drawn towards the ground, which makes sense because Ningguang is the one trying to ground Beidou when she's off gallivanting. And those were a lot of Genshin ships. Boy, am I tired. Thank you so much for sticking around though. I really appreciate it. I just kind of wanted to give a taste test for each ship. Just like, okay, Here's the gist of it. I didn't want to do a whole video essay on each ship, although I probably could if I really wanted to. If you want to see more Genshin ship type videos for me, then let me know. I'm hesitant to talk about what I ship for Genshin and what I don't ship, not because it's like bad or anything, but just because I just don't want to ostracize anybody. Like my palette for shipping is usually pretty basic and vanilla, I'll be honest. It's just like all the mainstream stuff, but I don't want to make anyone unintentionally feel bad for not shipping the same things I do or liking a ship that I'm not super fond of. I don't know. I don't really care if your ship's a rare pair or not. You do you, man. But yeah, thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye! <laughs>